In this week's episode of Ignition GT, Hyundai joins a lucrative compact crossover segment with the Kona. What a fun, fantastic engine. That one liter three cylinder is really punchy. We find out how marijuana can influence your driving and what the legalities are of driving high. With cannabis, it is fat soluble, so it stays in your body for anything up to 35 days. And the GT team puts the Mercedes-Benz C-Class Cabrio through its paces. When we were driving around, we were doing like the speed limit on the highway and we're sitting at just under 2,000 RPM, so you're saving fuel. Building a world car can present some real challenges. The biggest, probably, getting the name right. That cool, catchy phrase that really is going to sum up their creation, the essence of that vehicle. But the problem is, you can get seriously lost in translation, which is why for some manufacturers, they opt for just going with numbers. It is way safer. Hyundai just can't figure out what works best for them. First, we had the Tucson iX35 shambles, and then they brought us the Creta. It never sounded like a good name to start, but controversial in that in some countries it actually refers to female genitalia. Well, the Koreans' fixation with the Vajayjay continues, because now they brought us the Kona. Kona may mean lady in Hawaiian, but in Portuguese slang, it's a little more anatomically specific, so it will be badged in their market as the Kauai, an island off of Hawaii. But it's not just the name that's controversial. The styling of the Kona is definitely going to divide opinion. The front end with its twin headlight design is bold. The slash of the LED daytime running lights and cosmetic only matching grill detail I like. And the functional grill design is very sporty. But it's the position of the second set of lights I'm struggling with. These are the main projection headlamps. But because they are presented like you would a traditional fog light cluster with cladding for emphasis, they appear to be sitting too high up on the Kona's face. The actual fogs you'll find centrally positioned as part of the third level of the grille design. In profile, it's that cladding that dominates, Hyundai pushing hard the crossover nature of the urban warrior. The trim detailing cutting through the C-pillar have grooves to channel airflow, but it also emphasizes the integrated spoiler. The Kona is 105mm shorter than the more practical Creta, but its slightly longer wheelbase means shorter overhangs and a sportier overall stance. Don't expect to get too much into the boot, however. With just 361 litres, it's 40 litres smaller than the Creta. It has additional storage under the boot floor. Not sure what you'd put there, though. Visually, for me, there are a lot of similarities between the Kona and the CX-3, but you don't walk away from the Mazda feeling they've tried too hard on the design front. There are no divided opinions when you get behind the wheel, though. good news is that uh, Hyundai seemed to have solved their fuel issues which prevented them bringing their turbo engines to South Africa a while back. Now we're getting them and for the first time ever they've brought their one litre turbo to the market and that's what we're driving in the Kona. What a fun fantastic little engine. That one litre three cylinder is really punchy. 172 newton meters and uh, 88 kilowatts. Really fantastic. A little bit of turbo lag but I mean that's to be expected especially on the shift and talking about the shift it only comes in a six-speed manual it's such a pity because I think if they could bring this out in an auto that would be really good but for me I've been very impressed that they've been pushing the safety features in the Kona it comes with blind spot assist it's got lane departure the rear camera can also give you side assistance can pick up if cars are coming um, it comes with six airbags, which is fantastic, and electronic stability control. All of this is standard in the Kona, so good job there from a safety perspective for Hyundai. But you know the thing that I have been impressed with and enjoyed the most about driving this car is the drive. A few years ago we went to uh, Korea and I was blown away by how hard they were working at getting that premium feel to their drive. I mean, they've got like 80 different road surfaces to test the chassis and the suspension. And I tell you, it has paid off because the ride is 
really refined. The build quality feels fantastic. And where in the old days maybe the steering used to be a little bit vague, this is so on point. This is a really good car. And even though it's not sporty, a car you're going to be throwing around, can I tell you with the chassis, it's very, very happy to go into the bends and the steering feels really precise. That premium character follows through into the interior, which features contrasting surfaces and materials. There are two distinctive colour themes, lime for the acid yellow exterior colour and the red as seen on our test unit. And this colour is pulled through onto the stitching of the seats, which are upholstered in synthetic leather and cloth. It's also around the gear shifter and onto the multifunctional steering wheel that is height and reach adjustable. But my favourite is the colour accents around the air vents against the piano black detailing. That is just knockout. Taking centre stage on the dash is the 7-inch touchscreen infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, allowing you to mirror your smart device. It's easy to use either through the home page layout on the touchscreen or the fast buttons on the side. And the Kona Creta discussion continues as Hyundai essentially now has two vehicles competing in the highly congested compact crossover segment. But I don't see a problem with that. I mean, Renault does it with their Duster and Capture, and the two do appeal to totally different markets. Obviously, the Creta appealing to the more practical, traditional buyer out there, and the Kona is offering you new technology, uprated safety, and of course, way more daring design and look. But even though Hyundai comes with a really aggressive warranty, their service plans are competitive, and what we do like is that their cars are always very, very well specced as standard. Starting at 380,000 Rand for the one litre turbo petrol that we've been driving, up to 400,000 for the two litre naturally aspirated, I just think there's so many cars to choose from in the segment that a lot of South Africans could be looking at that price point and going, high corner. Now, as the Hyundai Creta is already one of the top-selling cars in its segment, it remains to be seen if the new Kona will be stealing some of those sales in future or if it's going to add additional numbers to the Korean company's overall tally. That's what Hyundai will be hoping for. After the break, we're going to take a closer look at another vehicle that has no problem when it comes to racking up sales, the Toyota Hilux. And a little later on in the show, the team spends some time with the updated Mercedes-Benz C-Class convertible. In September this year, the Constitutional Court of South Africa ruled that the personal use and cultivation of cannabis is no longer a criminal offence and in fact unconstitutional, a ruling which as you can imagine has caused a fair amount of public outcry. Now in a country where drunk driving is already a really serious problem and a big contributor to the number of road deaths, do we really need to offer road users another form of intoxication and what, if any, are the dangers involved when driving under the influence of marijuana? Well, we're at Geritech outside Johannesburg at a test track and we're actually on a skid pan to try and prove what the effects of cannabis are while driving because it's an extremely emotive subject. In an alcohol scenario, the minute you drink, you are, you are becoming impaired. But what we're trying to do here is to prove that if you smoke cannabis, there is a point where the driver themselves know that they are too impaired to drive. So that's the test we're doing today. We have a diverse group of volunteers today. We, we have regular cannabis users and we got some first timers and some semi-regulars. So we, we've tried to mix it up just to try and be as scientific as possible with the testing and just to see how it affects different people with, with their driving abilities. First of all, uh, they're going to attempt the Gymkhana sober and we're going to time them. Then they're going to have another run after they've had a joint and we're going to time them again and to see uh, whether their driving has deteriorated and if they hit any cones or hit more cones. And following that, they're going to possibly have another joint if the volunteers are willing and just to see as they become more stoned whether it uh, really impairs their driving or not. 
The first intoxicated run was ineffectual, as some participants actually completed the course quicker than others, while some performed slower. Now, we can attribute this to the participants actually becoming more familiar with the course, rather than stating marijuana actually enhanced their driving ability. The final run, which saw those partaking consume another hit of marijuana, provided more conclusive findings. The previous attempt saw only one cone being knocked over, but in this run, five cones were hit. This is a clear indication that the usage of marijuana had affected their driving abilities by inhibiting their concentration and their reaction times. However, the original premise of the test was to see whether users would be inclined to get behind the wheel of a car while intoxicated, and many reported afterwards that they were mindful of their current state and wouldn't attempt to drive. Of course, these results can't be viewed as definitive answers on the effects of marijuana and how that impacts your driving. More scientific studies need to be conducted to get a completely accurate result. But as more and more countries are adapting their legislation to allow the recreational use of marijuana, enforcing safe driving practices has become even more pertinent. The message from the JMPD is that you, if you're going to be driving, do not consume any drug or substance which has narcotic effect because there is a possibility that you will be charged for driving under the influence of such substance and you will be arrested. The sixth generation Isuzu KB has been on sale in South Africa since March 2013 and since then the Japanese company has introduced a number of model updates and limited editions in a bid to maintain interest in its aging workhorse. Needless to say, when we heard the KB was about to be spruced up yet again for 2019, we were curious to see just how they were going to blow some new life into the trusted Bucky. First of all, the KB is no longer called the KB, but will henceforth go by the name of D-Max, which it has worn overseas since 2002. At the front, you will notice a substantial redesigned grille that extends into slimmer headlamp clusters and the overall look of what is not dissimilar to Honda's solid wing face, as seen on the HRV compact crossover. Inside, there are new soft touch panels for the instrument cluster binnacle, while the dashboard and door trims gain a more attractive high quality grain. In keeping with the times, there's also a larger 8 inch touchscreen infotainment system. Mechanically, the biggest improvement is the fitment of a 6 speed manual or automatic transmission that makes for more refined cruising and, crucially, improved fuel economy. Quite by coincidence, the ignition team happened to have a facelift to Toyota Hilux on test at the same time that Isuzu introduced the D-Max, and during our week spent with the former, we were reminded once more just why it is such a formidable contender in the South African bucky market. One of the most contentious issues of the pre-facelift Hilux was that underbite. This new version with the facelift which we first saw in the Dakar edition is very nice. It gives us more of a butcher look. It's amazing, just by squaring things up on the front end, the new Hilux certainly has a way more imposing face. I like that a lot. We've got the 2.8 GD6, which is the top of the range diesel engine, um, and it really is a superb powertrain. Tractable, relatively refined for a diesel, and surprisingly economical. From a negative perspective, I still think that they can do more to improve the ride quality in the Hilux. Yes, the overall smoothness and refinement has been improved, but it's still choppy. I agree with Marius, the ride is a bit choppy, and overall I feel like the NVH levels are not as good as something like an Amarok. What don't I like about the Hilux? Actually, nothing. It's the perfect bucky, which is why they sell thousands of them every month. After the break, we're going to turn our attention from the tough, uh, ra, 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 you know what I mean, to the fairest of them all, Mercedes-Benz's achingly beautiful C-Class Cabriolet. Mercedes-Benz recently made a host of improvements to their entire range of C-Class models. To find out how much has improved, we handed the convertible over to Zipporah, Justin and Thomas for evaluation. All right, summer days. They are here. <laughs> and I see you've brought something very summerish. I don't like this color. Why I not? like the color. I hate the color. I think with something like this, you need something that pops. Pearl white. Thank you. Pearl white. He gets no. it. He yes. gets this it. This is elegant. 
This dates the car. So I do like the color. I didn't like that. It reminds me a bit of an SLK and that goes back to its outdated color. I kind of think the whole car in a whole looks like a cup of cappuccino. I take it that this is the new C-Class because uh, it's got new headlights yeah. and a new front bumper. Yeah. Kind of gives the car quite a nice futuristic menacing kind of vibe to it. It looks like a whole bunch of little teeth, you know, which is, which is quite nice. I also like the fact that they've cleaned out the front bumper with those louvers on the side. It looks really nice. I cannot tell the difference between the previous model and this one. I think up close with them next to each other, probably. Guys, I like the look of it from the side. It's, yeah, it's kind of a boulevard cruiser. I mean, Very you know, boulevard not... cruiser. I think the wheels are a bit too small though. Why? Yeah. Why do you have a lot of it? space here? Yeah, but smaller wheels make for a more comfortable ride. It's not all about the load. I don't care about that stuff. I do. I'm old now. Yeah, Justin, so you have a bad you know, back. Yeah, I have a bad back. I <laughs> want smaller say, wheels. The so Cora over yeah. here yeah. Yeah. will yeah. happily cruise with those big wheels. Yeah. I definitely will. slowly through Melrose Arch. It's yeah. all about the oh, look. I'm look making a statement exactly. when I roll up in this I mean, car. You ladies wear high heels and right? you complain about it, but you still wear it. Yeah, because it looks damn good. big wheels. The wheels are a bit small. They could have been... I want to say a few inches bigger. I think they are a little bit too small, but for me that's not a bad thing because you're trading styling for better ride comfort. Cities like Johannesburg especially where the roads are so bad, it's nice to have a little bit more meat on the tires. I like bigger rims, I like bigger things. My favorite is the back. I definitely like the back more than I love the front. Really? These rear lights look new though. Do they? they do change new. these. I don't know, man. They all look the same, Mercs. It's to the me. new signature sort of the tail lights that look. they have with the GLC, GLE. There's something there that you like chrome. Chrome. And exhaust. Chrome exhaust. Chrome exhaust pops. Definitely. I'm not into cabriolets, uh, but the badge does carry a lot of status. This is a status car through and through. This definitely fits in on the catwalks of Sandton City. Shopping bags galore in the back. All right, guys, so you like the exterior looks. What mm -hmm. do you think of the inside? I think there's a whole bark of a tree here. <laughs> this nice but hue. Guys, I like there's this. nothing I like, like this. a nice wooden touch. You know? You like that in your hand. Huh? I like I like a nice wooden touch in my yeah. hand. And yeah. this is nice wood. It's grainy. It's like, yeah, it's, it's real. really nice. Well, it's really nice. It's unvarnished. And I like unvarnished veneers because they, they kind of age well. Like antique furniture. And this is where I think the, the color on the outside goes well with the interior. The sort of age. Elegance. Elegance. Yes. See that big chunk of tree in the middle makes it stand out. New screen, guys. Yeah. yeah. Very nice, very crisp, HD. Mm -hmm. Nice to look at. And there's this new instrument cluster here in front. 12.3 inches. Already. Huh? <laughs> yeah. How could you tell from, uh, from, that, from back there? I, oh, I could tell a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, this car is very <laughs> compact, so he can see that. I can see. Close. Mm. Yeah, but I will go back to the screen. I mean, it resembles that of the A class and the S class as well. The infotainment system at first is very intimidating. There's a lot going on. There are lots of menus. From a, like a user's point of view and just visually, I mean, it's, it's, it's very smartphone, iPad-like. It just has a, a nicely thought out, slick feel to it. The A-Class has that double panel screen. I would have liked that as well, carried over to this side. And it's also in the S-Class, so why not bring everything to the C as well? And what about the infotainment interface? What do you guys think of this? It's new. It's yeah. been updated, right? Yeah, it's kind of updated. It's, it, it, it's not as fancy as the one in the A-Class. Definitely not. It's kind of just one below that. But I like how they've gone for separate menus now, which is, which is nice. And their whole user interface, it's just so visually appealing. Look, I mean, I was born in the 80s. I'm an analog kid, you know. I like, I like old school stuff, but I think there is a place with digital clusters and displays. And I think Mercedes does it well. I, yeah. What I want to find out is, does this thing have the Hey Mercedes function? Let's try. Let's try. Hey Mercedes! Hello, Mercedes. No. Nothing. I know that the new A-Class has the Hey Mercedes thing. Um, I think something like that will filter into other cars. I would have liked to have seen it on this car, seeing that this is the updated version. But I see what it does have. Yeah, uh -huh. what's that? Hey Zapora. <laughs> hey Zapora, put the roof <laughs> down. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah, I think we were getting a bit toasty here anyway. I don't know how you guys think about 
this gear lever on the indicator stalk. It was maybe a thing in the 90s. Yeah. That I don't know, for me, it always confuses me. It always takes me like a little bit of time to get acclimatized to. But I mean, it frees up so much space here in the middle. I guess so, yeah. You've got like your whole hand here. Mm. Yes. So, uh, you know. I mean, it does get confusing, but essentially, there's only one stalk that you're always going to use, which is the, the windscreen wipers and indicators. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now that everything's on the steering wheel, it's a very clean and neat looking uh, it dashboard. Is. It's, it's kind of a little bit daunting uh, the first time you get into it, but, yeah. but I find like the more you spend time with the Mercedes infotainment system and the way they lay stuff out, it's actually it well works thought, out. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's well thought through and it's easy to use. So those controls there, it looks uh -huh. so cluttered for me. It is, but again, like once you get acclimatized to it, it kind of becomes like second nature. As cool as what this convertible is, I am squished back here. I was about to ask, like, how are you doing back there? No, I feel like I'm sitting. Like, I can't even close my legs. What rear leg room? There's no rear leg room at the back. I could get from maybe my house to somewhere nice, but I wouldn't like to do a long road. Engine, we need to engine talk engine. Engine-wise, yeah. Because you were talking about those battery systems. This is a 1.5 litre, yeah. four-cylinder. So it's a C200. Yeah, petrol engine. Yes. Uh, with, and it's got a, a mild hybrid system, 48 volt. Uh, which just gives you a little bit of torque fill off the line, yeah. you know, like the old Honda CRZs. 135 kilowatts? Yeah, 135 kilowatts. We were driving really quick. And 280 newton meters of torque. When we were driving around, we were doing like the speed limit on the highway and it was sitting at just under 2,000 RPM. So you're saving fuel, there's enough torque. I think the gearbox is nice, it's, it's smooth. I think gears start getting too many at seven. So taking it up to nine is just, I don't know, it's just too many gears for me. You can never have too many gears. This isn't a sports car, it's not supposed to be a sports car, it's not meant for drag racing. Yeah. It's no. for like plush boulevard cruising. And there's a lot of low down grunt, which is nice, so you don't have to wring the neck out of it. I don't think the sound matches the looks. I would have liked maybe a more throatier sound. But then again, the car is elegant, so when you're just cruising along, it's good. Who cares about the engine when it's just that quiet and it looks that good? It's comfortable as well. I'll it give is quite it that. comfortable. It kind of wafts Look, along nice and easy. I'm comfortable, but I'm squished. No, man, I'm talking about ride quality. Stop talking about yourself. <laughs> you millennials, it's always about like, whatever. Me, me. Ride quality is quite good. Uh, I would like. Guys. Ride quality is nice, it's comfy. Um, it, it suits the car and what the car is designed for. It felt really nice and comfortable. Really plush and uh, the kind of car you want to drive around. As a passenger, obviously we were going at um, slow speeds and I think maybe this car is perfect for exactly that. It's just a cushy, comfortable, want to be seen in drop top summer accessory and I'm giving it a, a sultry seven. Overall impressions of this car, I think it's a sexy little number, drives well and I think I would give it seven and a half. Mm, I'm gonna go for seven and a half. Yeah, seven and a half. Fans of the three-pointed star may be disappointed with that score, but do bear in mind that the Cabrio is a niche model and cheaper. More mainstream derivatives might fare a little bit better. That does bring us to the end of our show, but be sure to tune in again next week when Zipporah gets behind the wheel of the long-awaited Kia Stinger. Let me just say that right off the bat, the Stinger takes on the role of a long-distance tourer so excellently. And we examine Toyota's impressive performance lineage, past, present and future. And in recent years, company CEO Akio Toyota has intensified efforts in sparking a resurgence of performance-orientated products that pander to those who love to drive. But until next time, buckle up, keep left, pass right, do all the good things on the road. Uh.